Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. Uh, let us today discuss another historical play by Girish Karnad called The Dreams of Tipu Sultan. Uh, like the previous, the previous play we discussed uh, on Tughlaq, again uh, Girish Karnad uh, uses the historical life of Tipu Sultan as his uh, raw material for the play The Dreams of Tipu Sultan. Uh, before we discuss the play, let us first uh, provide uh, provide us with a historical uh, context uh, in which the Sultan uh, is being discussed and uh, debated about even today. Uh, Tipu Sultan who was born Sultan Fateh Ali Sahib Tipu in uh, uh, 1750, right, uh, who was also known as Tipu Sahib, was the ruler of the kingdom of Mysore, which was a princely state. He was the eldest son of uh, Sultan Hyder Ali of Mysore, and uh, he uh, and there are interesting uh, details we know about his life, which distinguish him from his father Hyder Ali uh, in terms of of their rule. So, uh, unlike his father, who was uh, focused more on the modernization of the military, of the army, Tipu Sultan focused a lot more on uh, trade and commerce. Uh, so. He was, uh, he struck many international trade links with uh, France and uh, several other countries. He turned to France for their latest uh, technology on rockets and warfare and that really shows even in the cannons and uh, the rockets that he used which are still present today in the, the Tipu Museum in Mysore. The capital of Mysore was Sri Rangapatna and uh, Sri Rangapatna was also known for its uh, impregnable fort a fortress which could not be easily penetrated by enemies and that still exists today. Uh, and uh, uh, Hyder Ali had put an end to the uh, erstwhile Hindu rulers of Mysore which were the, the Wadiyar family which were of course reinstated once uh, Tipu Sultan was defeated and killed by the British. Uh, Tipu Sultan had also tried to uh, strike an alliance with Napoleon Bonaparte uh, and he had even sent uh, an emissary, an, uh, uh, an envoy to uh, Mauritius uh, uh, in, with the hope that, that uh, Napoleon, as promised, would uh, meet him in Mauritius after he had routed uh, the, uh, the Europeans and would come and meet him uh, and send forces to, uh, to reinforce his own army uh, against the British. Right? But uh, that never happened. So <coughs> the uh, area of uh, the Mysore Kingdom uh, the princely state uh, included uh, Malabar uh, and uh, uh, Tipu Sultan's father Hyder Ali rose to power capturing Mysore uh, and Tipu Sultan succeeded his father Hyder Ali in uh, 1782 following his father's death from cancer. Uh, there, were there were many important victories that Tipu Sultan won against the British uh, across the four wars, especially the first two wars that he, he fought against the British. The four wars uh, that ended in Tipu Sultan's death were called the uh, Anglo-Mysore Wars, which were fought from 1784, uh, 1782 to uh, 1799 when uh, Tipu Sultan was killed. Uh, he succeeded uh, Mysore upon his father's death in 1782. He won important victories against British in the second um, Mysore, uh, Anglo-Mysore War. And he also negotiated the Treaty of Mangalore in 1784 after his father's death. And Tipu Sultan also had made conflicts with uh, his neighbours, which included the Marathas and the Nizam of Hyderabad. And so he also had to uh, sign a treaty, the, 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 the Treaty of Gajendragad, with, uh, uh, at the end of the Maratha Mysore War, where, uh, which required Tipu Sultan to pay uh, several million rupees uh, as a one-time war cost to the Marathas and an annual tribute of 1.2 million rupees 
uh, in addition to returning all the territory that his father Hyder Ali had captured. Tipu Sultan, to, till the very end of his life, remained uh, an implacable enemy of the British East India Company, and uh, he also uh, sparked conflict uh, with his attack on British allied Travancore, which was also a princely state, in 1789. In the third Anglo Mysore, Anglo -Mysore War, uh, he was forced into the Treaty of Seringapatnam or Sri Rangapatnam. Uh, where he lost a number of uh, previously conquered territories, including Malabar and Mangalore. He had also sent many emissaries to foreign states, including the Ottoman Empire, Afghanistan and France, in an attempt to uh, rally opposition against the British. And it was in the fourth Anglo-Mysore War, uh, where uh, the, uh, the British East India Company, with the help of the Nizam of Hyderabad, uh, defeated Tipu Sultan, uh, who was killed on 4th, 4th, 4th of May 1799 while defending his fort of Sri Rangapatna. Uh, the interesting thing about Tipu Sultan is that he was one of the few uh, South Indian kings who actually uh, provided stiff resistance to British imperialism along with his father Hyder Ali. He was in historical accounts applauded as a ruler who fought against British colonialism. Uh, but he was also seen as a very controversial figure who uh, repressed uh, Hindus and Christians. Now we need to go into the debates. In fact, even today, the, the right wing, the BJ, BJP and the RSS, along with uh, other uh, leaders and parties are actually uh, debating over uh, the celebration of Tipu Jayanti in Karnataka. And so uh, it will be interesting to see what kinds of historical uh, and official records they rely on to make these arguments for or against uh, Tipu Sultan. Now the main record that we see, uh, one of the main histories that uh, many of these uh, right-wing activists and others uh, you know, rely on is uh, Mir Hussain Ali uh, Khan Kirmani's history of Tipu Sultan. Right? And uh, Mir Hussain Ali Khan Kirmani also constitutes a character in the play, uh, Dreams of Tipu Sultan. And in the history of Tipu Sultan, he concludes that uh, Tipu was a Muslim fanatic. Uh, but there have been many debates uh, qualifying this claim that he was a, ra a rabid supporter of Islam and he needed Islam to actually uh, rally people against the British. There's lots of evidence and inf information to, su to suggest that uh, you know, he wasn't, one cannot just easily call him a, a Muslim fanatic. So for instance, Mysore was called Musliman territory uh, in the history when a majority of its inhabitants were actually Hindu. Uh, and this information, uh, many of these debates uh, around the Sultan can be read, can be uh, uh, found in um, certain few articles uh, on uh, uh, JSTOR and EPW. One of them is called Tipu Sultan giving the devil, in quotes, his due by Bhupendra Yadav. And then there's also a review of the historian Irfan uh, Habib's uh, uh, edited collection uh, called Confronting Colonialism, Resistance and Modernization under Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan, uh, which was published by Tulika in 1999. And you also have another important uh, article which explores the debates uh, and the controversies around Tipu Sultan, uh, which is called Sultan and the Saffron by Alex George. So these are all articles that you can easily find on EPW, on the Economic and Political Weekly, as well as JSTOR. Now, for example, in uh, Pupendra Yadav's article, uh, Yadav argues that uh, there were lots of uh, pieces of information and evidence to show that, uh, that one cannot simply dismiss Tipu Sultan as a Muslim fanatic. Uh, so for one, uh, there was uh, the fact that Mysore was a Hindu major majoritarian state. And, uh, uh, there's also evidence to suggest that uh, Tipu Sultan patronized uh, several important uh, Hindu uh, monasteries and mats. One, of course, is the Sringeri Mat, to whom uh, he was known to have grant, uh, given them many land grants and a lot of money and wealth to support the mat uh, and its activities. He also protected the mat against the attacks by the Marathas uh, to vandalize uh, the idols in the mat. You know, one needs to also qualify uh, the claims that are being made to prove that uh, Tipu was was uh, a fanatic and a bigot, right? because there were, there were, there's an instance where for, uh, where he was said to have exiled 60,000 Canaries Christians, right? And some scholars argue that the uh, the exiling of these Canaries Christians was uh, apparently because they helped the British conquer Mangalore during the Second uh, Anglo-Mysore War. 
uh, which is something that Tipu Sultan could not tolerate. So, but on the other hand, uh, Bhupin Riyadav argues uh, that if Tipu Sultan were actually anti-Christian, then uh, he would not have treated the Syrian, the Syrian Christians of his kingdom well, nor would he have encouraged Armenian merchants to settle in Mysore. Right? So it's, it's, one has to uh, look at the nuances of uh, this man's history to understand uh, the basis for uh, his, uh, his actions. Right? So when he decided to actually patronize someone or, or an institution or take care, take care of certain communities which were under his uh, rule, as opposed to uh, you know, attacking or exiling certain other people who belong to the same community, then there were very clear uh, military and strategic reasons for doing so. Uh, so this is not to suggest that uh, Tipu Sultan did not carry out forced conversions uh, to Islam, uh, especially from territories that were ceded to him or the territories that he actually conquered. But uh, it's also important to qualify the, uh, the numbers that, are, that official histories uh, record of the number of people who were actually converted uh, and, uh, to Islam. There are other instances of how uh, the Sultan requested the Archbishop of Goa to send Catholic priests for his Christian subjects who were neglecting their religious duties. So it was actually Tipu's own official court chroniclers who had a passion for Islam, Islamization. It's, uh, so Bhubendra Yadav makes a very interesting point when he says that it's these chroniclers who wanted their ruler to be perceived as followers, as ardent, uh, intolerant followers of Islam. Of course, another very important instance to suggest that Tipu Sultans also patronized Hindus is the, were the presence of upper caste Hindus in his own court. One, of course, is Prime Minister Purnaya, who is also a character in the play. And then you also have Krishna Rao, Shama Ayengar, who occupied very high positions in the court and also were his greatest confidants. Right? So it's not uh, easy to just dismiss Tipu Sultan as someone who was anti-Hindu or anti-Christian. He also gave or uh, gifted land to temples and Brahmins, uh, including those in Malabar, uh, against whose Nayas Tipu, Tipu took revenge. He also uh, paid, uh, he also uh, patronized and sponsored the construction of the Gopur temple in Kanjivaram. And even the temples within uh, the Seringapatna uh, fort uh, flourished, including the Ranganatha temple which flourished uh, under his rule. He also made war on the on the rulers of Savanur, Karnul, Adoni, Hyderabad and Karnatik who were all Muslims. So again, this suggests that one cannot equate him uh, as, uh, as a, simply as a, as a Muslim fanatic who was against uh, Hindus and Christians because he does punish, he does wage war against fellow Muslims just as he also rewards and patronizes uh, Hindu Brahmins and institutions. The play uh, Dreams of Tipu Sultan also portrays the, the ways in which Tipu Sultan could actually foresee the, uh, the growing threat of the British Empire uh, from its early days as a trading uh, uh, and, and mercantile uh, agency to an administrative power. So he was very prescient in trying to pursue alliances with uh, the Marathas and the Nizam of Hyderabad to actually um, fight uh, against the British in a united fashion. But that of course fails because the British are very clever. They also realize that Tipu Sultan is a growing threat to their own uh, monopoly uh, in trade and power and, and, uh, and economics that they decide to uh, suppress Tipu Sultan, they try to isolate him. They try to, of course, divide and rule. Uh, so even though the princes uh, of, uh, of India had uh, signed treaties amongst themselves to keep uh, off uh, each of the territories, in fact, they had, the Marathas had signed a treaty of perpetual peace with, um, the, uh, the, with Tipu Sultan. And uh, so there was uh, an attempt to try and uh, retain a semblance of peace uh, and non-interference between the different princely states. But uh, the British took advantage of this. They exploited the fact that there could be potential conflict between these different princely states and, and powers. And so they also saw the ways in which uh, Tipu Sultan was growing as trading power and uh, rather wealthy state uh, which, could, which boasted of uh, one of the highest uh, living uh, life standards, living standards in, in, in the world. Uh, and um, 
so they actually wanted to uh, suppress him partly because he was uh, striking alliances both for strategic as well as uh, economic alliances with uh, many other powers uh, including France actually draw, drew a lot from the latest technology warfare technology from France he also tried to uh, you know st uh, strike alliances he sent letters to uh, arabia to persia to muscat to delhi uh, to oud to hyderabad and pune he also sent proposals to jodhpur jaipur and kashmir uh, and he sent embassies to all these places in order to actually uh, create a, a united front against the british but obviously all these attempts to try and create a united opposition to the british failed and um, uh, even the european traders in fact uh, could not succeed in asserting or uh, inserting a favorable provision on trade monopoly in uh, the treaties with Tipu Sultan. So all the foreign merchants, uh, the British uh, merchants and businessmen could not really flourish uh, uh, under the treaties with Tipu Sultan. So he was very particular to impose uh, duties and taxes on these European merchants, British merchants. So he was finally uh, defeated and killed in 1799 in the, at the end of the fourth uh, Anglo-Mysore war, uh, after which he was, uh, you know, he had to sign a treaty and he had to cede half of his territory, territory to the British. But he continued his resistance, uh, which culminated in a further confrontation in which he had to face the combined might of the British, the Marathas and the Nizam. So, as we discussed earlier, there are many, um, several pieces of information and, and uh, data to suggest that the Sultan uh, was not, uh, you know, purely a Muslim fanatic or somebody who was against Hindus and Christians because, for example, he never imposed the jizya as Aurangzeb did on uh, non-Muslim uh, uh, Muslims. Uh, he also had a close relationship with the Sringeri Mutt and um, he was known to actually donate uh, tax-free, uh, uh, rent-free land uh, to temples and mosques and religious personae in South Malabar and Cochin. In fact, most of his religious uh, land grants are to Hindu temples and Hindu religious persons more than Muslim uh, mosques and Muslim religious institutions and leaders. He also made a huge grant of uh, 669 acres, this is from uh, Alex George's article, Sultan and the Saffron, uh, of uh, uh, a huge grant of 669 acres to the uh, Guruvayur Temple of Kerala. And later on, the Sultan's introduction of land tax uh, in uh, antagonize the landlord castes of Malabar and, and the Nambudris, the Nambudri Brahmins of Kerala in particular. Uh, and with the ascendancy of the Nayars who were, who were, who were predominantly a military caste um, and had a certain rights and land as well, um, they could no longer serve in the military right, and or enforce privileges. And he also, for example, uh, introduced dresses which uh, would cover the, the bosoms of females uh, and he also disapproved of polyandry among Nair women, uh, which enraged the Nairs. And it was under him that the other lower castes uh, flourished, the lower castes who, who worked uh, under, the, uh, under, the, under the upper castes flourished in their own ways. Uh, many of them were military castes, many of them were also agoristic ag agricultural caste groups. So there has been an attempt in contemporary times to try and tarnish the the, the complex and contradictory image of Tipu Sultan and reduce him to being someone who was a Muslim bigot, who was against Hindus and Christians. But it's important to also understand Tipu Sultan in a much wider and larger picture as someone who was also interested uh, in keen and trade and commerce, as someone who uh, granted a, was very generous with his money and land to Hindu and Christian religious organizations and leaders and also as someone who was uh, not interested in only the modernizing the military as his father was but also was in interested in, in striking collaborations and alliances with both foreign as well as uh, other Indian princely states. So to turn to the play now, let's look at the some of the characters, uh, the, who are the major characters in the play, right? So you have um, Colin McKenzie who was an important uh, oriental missionary scholar who was responsible for collecting and, save, uh, and preserving many important manuscripts from the south. Uh, you have Hussein Ali Kirmani who is the Tipu Sultan's official chronicler. Uh, you have uh, Mark Wills, you have Safar, you have Arthur Wellesley who is the younger, younger brother of the uh, second the successive uh, Governor General, the Earl of Mornington, uh, Robert Wellesley, the Earl of, Warn the Earl of Mornington. You have Nadeem Khan, 
you have Tipu Sultan, you have Purnia, who was his Hindu chief minister, and uh, you have several other uh, nobles from the court who end up betraying Tipu Sultan uh, towards the end of his life uh, in the fourth Anglo-Mysore war. So you have Mir Sadiq, you have Ghulam Ali Khan, you have Osman Khan, you have Fath Haider, who was his older son, uh, Muizuddin, Abdul Khalik. You have the uh, representative of the first Governor General, uh, Lord Cornwallis, Charles Malley. You have Nana Fadnavis, uh, the ruler of the uh, uh, state of Pune, uh, the Maratha state of Pune. And you have Rukaya Banu, uh, Hasina, Lord Cornwallis, Kamaruddin, Hyder Ali, his father, who appears in a dream, Hari Pant, and the Colonel William Kirkpatrick. The first act is set in the house of the historian Mir Hussain Ali Khan Kirmani. <laughs> उनके वाले और उनकी 
خدمت میں اور اب آپ کے لیے کام کر رہا ہوں جو جو ان کے دشمن ہیں یہ میرے کون سے پہلو کی نشان نہیں کرتے ہیں دغا بازی کیا اب بھی میں بھروسے مند ہوں اب اس بات سے پریشان نہیں ہیں میں خود پریشان ہوں آپ حسین علی کرمان ہمارے جس بھی آن فیڈاری صرف ہسٹری کے ساتھ ہے اپنے جس بات کو اس میں شامل نہ کریں stick to the facts as easy as that آپ کا مطلب یا داشت ہے دیکھئے یہی وہ نکتہ ہے جہاں اصل تگا بازی پائی جاتی ہے میں ابھی کچھ دیر پہلے یہ یاد کرنے کی کوشش کر رہا تھا کہ وہ اپنے آخری وقت کیسے نظر آتا ہے And uh, like the previous play, Tuglak, this play is also about what it means to write history. How does it, what, are, what are the politics of writing history? How does one interpret and, and utilize uh, official histories? What is the relationship between official history and, let's say, a certain memory, a certain personal memory of the Sultan? And in fact, the first act is really about the, uh, the uh, very fraught relationship between memory and history. Because Mackenzie represents a certain objective uh, school of uh, colonial uh, missionary, you know, history writing, which uh, keeps away emotion in its uh, objective truth claims about history, while uh, Kirmani is uh, someone who is uh, who personally knew Tipu Sultan as his official chronicler, and uh, but uh, unfortunately he is not able to remember what Tipu Sultan's face looked like on the day he fell to the British and the Marathas and uh, the Nizam. So he, it's, it's, it's really about uh, the uh, kind of battle between memory and history. So where official history ends, uh, that's exactly where Kirmani's memory of the Sultan begins, but it is a memory that is uh, incomplete. It's, 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 uh, it's blurred. And it's, it, he, he's unable to capture all the details of the Sultan's uh, personality, his bearing, his emotions. Uh, and his face, his facial expressions on the day he was killed. Kirmani also is unable to actually write complete history of Tipu Sultan because he, f he feels terribly saddened by the fact that Tipu Sultan was betrayed by his own uh, nobles uh, on the day he died. And the play constantly switches back and forth between conversations between Kirmani and Mackenzie, who then become uh, commentators uh, in the background to the action that is taking place, that took place in the past. Right. So you have uh, the play being framed initially by uh, a conversation between Mackenzie and Kirmani and then you have actual scenes that go, uh, that are flashbacks to actual scenes uh, f uh, that are set, for example, in the fort of Sri Dangapatna and uh, to uh, the time uh, when after the war uh, they are trying to look for the Sultan's body and they are unable to find it until one of the British uh, so Indian soldiers shines a torch on one of the bodies which is undoubtedly Tipu Sultan's body and the soldiers of course are completely shocked uh, and saddened and start lamenting the loss of the Sultan. So for instance, um, in the initial debate between objective history and uh, a certain affective emotional memory of Tipu Sultan, Mackenzie says to Kirmani, that's understandable. There's no healing. Kirmani says there's no healing through the blood and the tears dried up a long time ago. But the wounds remain fresh. Mackenzie replies, that's understandable. I mean, you were close to him, but you're also a historian. You need, need to develop a certain objectivity. Kirmani, yes, that's what you keep telling me, Mackenzie Sahib. Objectivity, dispassionate distance. Is that even possible? Is it possible to write an absolutely objective, emotionless history of a person of a ruler and Kirmani is unable to acknowledge overcome the way in which uh, Tipu Sultan was destroyed through betrayal. Mackenzie says you're being melodramatic. Every bit of evidence we've gathered proves he asked for it. Kirmani, yes for you he's made up of bits of evidence, bits of argument that prove that your side was right and that's what I don't understand. You have your version of history all worked out. Why do you want my side? Why, why do you care? Mackenzie, I'm interested in the other side. You could say that's how we Europeans are brought up, to be interested in the other side as well. 
that has supposes our strength, right? So he seems to be uh, making claims of objectivity because he's interested in what the other side has to say. But then, uh, as as uh, Akirmani says, it's the British who have won ultimately, and it's their version of official history which will be embraced as the only version and received as the only 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 version. Mackenzie says our loyalty is to history, Akirmani ji. When Akirmani is very upset that he is now having to work for the very people who betrayed and killed the Sultan that he, he now has to work as their official historian. Mackenzie says, our loyalty is to history, Kirmani ji. Keep emotion out, stick to the facts. Kirmani, you mean memories, but that's where the real betrayal lies. Do you know, I was just trying to remember what he looked like on the last day, and I just couldn't. And then later on, uh, Kirmani uh, reveals a letter that Tipu Sultan had uh, given uh, him uh, just on the day of the war. Uh, when he died and it was a, a letter of his dream right so the the dream that he gets just before he dies is a dream that also recurs towards the end of the play right so the entire play is framed by Tipu Sultan's last dream a dream of absolute victory and that is the last thing that you know he remembers uh, about Tipu Sultan his dream when of course uh, the body is discovered Tipu Sultan's corpse is discovered. The soldiers completely lose respect. They have no respect for the corpse. And one of them uh, chops uh, one of Tipu Sultan's mustaches as a memento in his, in his memory. So they kind of uh, desecrate his body. And the entire kingdom of Mysore is looted after the war. Right? Women are raped, jewelry is stolen. The soldiers uh, who have uh, ransacked the entire city have looted it and pillaged the entire city. There's nothing left. There's also a reference to uh, Tipu Sultan's attempt to try and seek Napoleon Bonaparte's support when he sends uh, an embassy to Mauritius to the French ambassador uh, Melarctic. And that the British get to know. They intercept uh, him and they intercept the supplies and they make sure that Napoleon never reaches the coast of India. Kirmani also believes the dream that, 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 that the diary where Tipu Sultan had recorded and, and preserved his dreams should have been destroyed because it was personal, it was private. But for Mackenzie, even, even those, those diary of dreams is uh, an objective evidence of Tipu Sultan's uh, treachery, of, of Tipu Sultan's uh, plans uh, to, uh, to secure uh, a united opposition against the British. So, Nothing of the, that belongs to, to, to Tipu Sultan is left uh, as a private uh, object. Right? Everything is appropriated uh, by the British. So for Kirmani, Tipu Sultan's diary was sacred and personal. Right? It was only until uh, Munshi Habibullah discovered the, the diary and gave it to the British that they discovered all of Tipu Sultan's dreams, which, were, uh, uh, which symbolized his own ambitions. Uh, for power. There are also descriptions towards the middle of Act 1 which describe uh, Tipu Sultan's uh, trade connections with uh, the Emperor of China uh, who sends him a white elephant and horses as a token of the friendship and affection. He also has a dream. One of uh, Tipu Sultan's first dreams is about uh, how um, he dreams he's, 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 uh, he's as powerful as Alexander. Right? And uh, this is, of course, uh, a reference to the fact that the, the, the emperor of China had only uh, given, gifted uh, a white elephant uh, to uh, the Alexander the Great. And the, only, the second person now was Tipu Sultan. So he, he kind of identifies himself with uh, the supremacy, uh, the territorial sovereignty of Alexander the Great. We also get information of how uh, Tipu Sultan was well informed of the technological innovations in other uh, empires. So he learns of a paper and currency being produced in China. He also uh, discovers or he learns of how they've been using silkworms to produce silk. So he, he imports silkworms from China uh, to start his own silk industry. He also wants to uh, consolidate his empire, his, his princely state as a trading, major trading power. Right? So he makes it very difficult for uh, the government, uh, for, for traders from, uh, from abroad to uh, actually um, 
uh, flourish uh, or carry out even their business in his own princely state because of the high taxes that he imposes on these traders. So he patronizes uh, and sponsors only the government shops and warehouses which completely uh, scared off the other traders from, uh, from outside, the private traders, the small traders who have come to carry out trade. They are completely intimidated by uh, Tipu Sultan's government uh, shops and warehouses. Uh, Tipu Sultan is also very uh, keen on modernizing uh, his own warfare technology. So he, he wants to import a lot of glass, he wants to import guns, he, needs, he wants to import cannons. So he says uh, on 195 that we need glass, we need guns, we need cannons. Shall we keep buying them from abroad? So this emphasis that we should now try and produce our own warfare, uh, I mean military uh, technology uh, in order to flourish and for which they need money. Right? So even for that we need money and shall we be content with the pittance we get by taxing our businessmen when we have ivory and sandalwood freely available? Can an individual trader deal in sandalwood? For centuries we begged and borrowed silk from the Chinese and everyone predicted disaster when I got a few eggs from China and now we have a flourishing industry of our own. Shall we sit back like the stupid Nizam and the Marathas who continue as though the English never existed, indeed as though the Europeans never existed? Any other meal? So he's very aware of uh, the necessity of developing his own internal uh, trade and commerce uh, in order to become a formidable uh, power that could potentially keep uh, stem British power and authority. And so he chastises, uh, he derides and berates uh, the other princely states like the Nizam of Hyderabad or the Marathas who seem to not acknowledge uh, the, the, the threatening uh, presence of the British. He also uh, tutors, uh, he has a, a Persian tutor who, will, uh, who teaches his sons Persian. So he's also very concerned that they should, they should learn Persian and, uh, and probably keep away from English, which is the language of the colonizer. He also arranges for a, a royal delegation uh, of Mysore to go to France through Pondicherry, right, uh, which then becomes a, a French outpost in order to actually secure the support of Napoleon Bonaparte to his own uh, opposition against the British. He also realizes that um, the French have access to superior military, te military technology. So he tells uh, one of his uh, nobles, Osman Khan, to be a messenger, an emissary to the French court. He tells Osman Khan, I'll give you a letter for King Louis the Sixteenth, but a letter is no substitute for direct persuasion. You must convince the king that if the French don't wake up, the English will gobble up the whole of India. The French here have become listless. The king must prod them, kick them if necessary, into activity. Louis and I could treat, could sign a treaty of perpetual alliance. Then if 10,000 French soldiers could march under me, under me, make that clear, no separate treaties with the British or the other Indian princes, I give the orders. If the king could give me that, that little, we could change the face of India. Right? So he, is, he has a lot of foresight in seeking the French support uh, to drive the British out of India. And he tells his other messenger, Ghulam Ali Khan, when you return, bring with you not just the 10,000 soldiers, but French craftsmen who could make guns, cannons, pistols. Right? So, on, on, so even if he is uh, keen on uh, making his uh, state uh, economically viable and, and independent, he also seeks the support of foreign powers like the French and, uh, and, their, and their own craftsmen who can produce uh, this, uh, the best guns, cannons and pistols. He's also looking for opportunities for business with the Imam of Muscat, who meets Mir Sadiq says, has fallen in love with the sandalwood and spices of our land and permitted us to build a factory for our products there. So he's, he's keen on furthering uh, business opportunities uh, for trade industry. He also makes a list of professionals that they would need. So he asks his Chief Minister Purnaya to prepare a list which includes a doctor, a surgeon, a smelter, a carpenter, a weaver, a blacksmith, a locksmith, a cutter and so on and also a watchmaker, a dyer, and even a gardener who was then responsible for making, uh, designing the beautiful garden of Lal Bagh, which still exists in Bangalore, and for which the Sultan and his father Hyder Ali had also imported many uh, seeds and saplings from all across the world. So he wanted to actually design Lal Bagh on the garden of Versailles in uh, France. So obviously Tipu Sultan is also drawing from Europe, much as he detests 
the British as a formidable European power. He also draws a lot from uh, the latest inventions uh, in Europe, right, in the field of warfare as well as aesthetics, uh, as well as gardening, painting, art and so on. Right? So he says, uh, he tells Osman Khan that uh, you should bring in varieties of trees and flowers and bushes. And he said that's what makes Europe so wonderful. It's full of new ideas, inventions, all kinds of machines bursting with energy. Why don't we in our country think like them? And then he also discovers a new, a new invention called the thermometer, which is supposed to actually uh, measure uh, body temperature, especially when one has fever. So they're completely amazed and struck by all these new inventions. And obviously, Tipu Sultan wants to borrow and uh, imitate uh, these new European inventions. Unlike uh, some of the other princely uh, kings of, Mar of the Marathas uh, empire or the Nizam, uh, Tipu Sultan is not intimidated by the British. He neither seeks their support nor is he intimidated by them. Right? Uh, or for that matter, even the, the first uh, Governor General, uh, Lord Cornwallis, who was uh, uh, who initially uh, led the British troops against uh, the uh, uh, in in the in the in the American War of, war of Independence, uh, and was miserably defeated in that war, and was then made con uh, Governor General of of India. So, um, he, uh, Tipu Sultan is very aware of uh, the fact that the British and the French are arch enemies and that, that even though they have, they have signed the Treaty of Versailles where they will not uh, interfere in the local affairs of each other's uh, colonies, uh, Tipu Sultan realizes that he can still uh, exploit the differences because he knows that the French and the English can never remain uh, friends forever. So he, he does want to actually exploit the differences that they already have, their rivalry. So he is completely contemptuous of uh, Cornwallis for having lost uh, the uh, American War of Independence against uh, George Washington, who was just a farmer. So he he does uh, he does not think of him as as a, as a threat or even as a as a rival uh, worth considering. He is convinced that if he is able to strike alliances uh, and uh, put up a united opposition to the British, that he will be able to drive them out of the country. Then there's another scene between uh, encounter between uh, Nana Fadnavis of the Maratha court and uh, Charles Malley, who is the representative of Lord Cornwallis. So in principle, the East India Company is supposed to have adopted a very pacific uh, attitude of non-interference against the Indian uh, princely states. Right? So he has no, they have no intention of entering into confrontation with any of the Indian princes. And uh, Charles Malley uh, claims that the, that the allies of the British, which include the Sindhyas, the Varatha chiefs, the Nizam of Hyderabad, and the Nawabs of Karnataka and Aud, and the Rajas of Travancore and Cochin, right, are uh, supporters of the British. Right? But uh, he perceives Tipu Sultan as a growing threat to uh, the British monopoly and supremacy in, in finance and commerce. And so even though uh, the Nana, uh, the Maratha Empire has signed a treaty of perpetual peace with Tipu Sultan that uh, Charles Malay is unwilling to actually accept that as a sacro sacrosanct agreement and he tries to win over the Nana support in order to fight uh, Tipu Sultan. But uh, Nana Fadnavis is, uh, is certain to actually f um, honor the treaty that uh, he signed with Tipu Sultan to not interfere with each other. There's also a reference to the Second Anglo-Mysore War, where the Treaty of Mangalore was forced upon the British who were defeated by Tipu Sultan. And, uh, you know, basically under Lord Cornwallis, uh, nothing can be done about Tipu Sultan's growing uh, power. So even though Lord Cornwallis's plan is to make the Marathas and the Nizam uh, join powers with the British um, uh, East India Company, that uh, they're unable to actually uh, manage the, the war against Tipu Sultan, um, they decide to actually declare war on Tipu Sultan independently of each other, f f attacking him from three directions. But that never happens because Tipu Sultan and his father have himself they've been responsible for actually fighting the Marathas and the Nizam in the past and uh, taking away, dispossessing them of a considerable part of their territory. So the Marathas know they have no hope of facing Tipu Sultan and defeating him uh, single-handedly, which is why they need the power, they need the support of the Nizam and the British. 
and with the French uh, military support of uh, the Sultan, uh, he has become indeed a formidable opponent that no one can hope to defeat single-handedly. Later on, in uh, towards the end of Act One, uh, Tipu Sultan again acknowledges the, the the contribution of the British who have taught him trade. He says, "My father taught me war, and the British, the English, taught me trade. They taught me that the era of the camel is over, and it is now the age of the sailing ship." Right. So obviously, Tipu Sultan has, has learned a lot. He draws a lot from the uh, superior technology of the of the British, which is why he he needs access to the sea. Right, and uh, sea trade and to ships which uh, for him would be the, the greatest source of power because it would ensure his uh, alliance with uh, Napoleon and uh, the reinforcements of, uh, uh, of arms and weapons and uh, craftsmen through the sea. But towards the end of the third uh, Mysore uh, British war, um, when Lord Cornwallis attacked or invaded, invaded Mysore in 1790, the Nizam and the Marathas also launched parallel attacks. And there's a war, and by the end of which, Cornwallis enters the foot of the fort of Seringapatnam, but is unable to attack it or capture it because it is such an impregnable fort. And uh, so he's unable to actually defeat the uh, uh, Tipu Sultan. And on the return journey, the English forces. Uh, run into the Marathas with their abundant supplies and the two forces again attack Sh Patnam. So Tipu Sultan is finally forced to sue for peace for which uh, Lord Cornwall Cornwallis has four conditions. One of course is that all the English prisoners who were taken by, the, uh, by Tipu Sultan had to be released unconditionally considering that uh, the British uh, uh, prisoners of war had been uh, ill-treated maltreated, ill-treated by uh, Tipu, while uh, they claim that the Indian prisoners of war that had been captured by the British had not been ill-treated, that they had, they, had, they had still been treated with a certain degree of respect. They had not been tortured. The second condition, of course, is that uh, Tipu Sultan would have to secede, uh, cede half of his domain, uh, which was adjacent to the territories of the English, the Marathas, and the Nizam. Right? So a lot of the land that became part of the Mysore Empire, uh, the Mysore state had been uh, conquered and captured by his father Hyder Ali. Right? So a lot of these territories had to be given back to the Marathas and the Nizam and the British. And he also, the other condition of course is that uh, he pay an indemnity of six crores, six crore rupees as an indemnity as the war of, co as the cost for war. And the last condition is that he send two hostages to the British to be kept under them until the terms of the treaty are duly fulfilled. Right? So he, he sends two of his older sons to uh, the British so that the British can ensure that the Sultan honours the four conditions of the treaty. The four, the four conditions being that he release all British uh, English prisoners of war, that he uh, cede or give up half the domain, half of his domain to which are, are the, the ter territories adjacent to the English, the Marathas and the Nizam, and that he also pay an indemnity of six crores, and finally that he give uh, two hostages, namely his two sons, as hostages to the British until the uh, conditions of the treaty are honoured. So Tipu Sultan has no choice but to send uh, Fath Haider and his second son to the British because he has faith in the English that they will not harm the children, they will not poison them or kill them, for there's no financial profit in it. Right? So he is convinced that they will not harm his children. But the greatest danger that he fears is that the British will teach his children English, which is exactly what he doesn't want. He doesn't want his children to learn English or to imitate the technological marvels of the British or be seduced by the magic of their technology. Tipu Sultan um, is not willing to give up so easily to the British. Even though he uh, seems to honour all the conditions, he fights them till the tooth and nail to the very end. And he has a dream, one more dream about his father, uh, Haider Ali, who appears. And uh, the conversation is like this. He says, uh, Tipu says, where are you, father? And Haider says, here, under this tree. Tipu, under this, father, why are you lying there? What's happened to you? Haider, I'm maimed, Tipu, I have no limbs. So Haider Ali in the dream is limbless. But you never lost any limb. You have maimed, maimed me, Tipu. 
Haider says, you've cut off my limbs and handed them over to the enemy. Tipu, yes, father, I've done that. Have you come to punish me? Haider, what punishment would be adequate, do you think? Tipu, I don't know, father. You, rem you remember once I messed up your campaign and you gave me a lashing, almost skin me, skin me alive. My body still bears those welts, such scars that I am ashamed to undress in front of anyone. This crime is much worse than that. So he obviously, it's a dream, a dream which expresses Tipu Sultan's guilt, uh, severe guilt for having uh, given up his sons as hostages to the British. I can't do that now. I have no arms, Haider Ali says. Tipu, shall I lash myself for you? Haider, no melodrama, I pray you. No hysterics, please. You've gone soft. You spend too much time with your account books. Tipu, you spend your life on horseback making conquests. I have to consolidate your gains. That can't be done on horseback. The English are stronger now. So it, this, the dream also expresses the differences between Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan. That during Hyder Ali's time, he was more keen on modernizing the military. And uh, he did not have the access to the kind of technology that Tipu Sultan later had. So a lot of the conquests that Hyder Ali made were made on horseback, while now Tipu Sultan is thinking about ships, for instance. Uh, and the English, who are now a much stronger power than they ever were. And whose fault is it, Hyder Ali asked, that the English are stronger? Tipu, I hate them, and they return the compliment. Haider, then why did you let Cornwallis escape? When he was retreating from sharing a Putnam in shame and desperation, your Amiris and Khans begged you to attack. You stood on the, on the ramparts and I did nothing. Tipu, I was paralyzed. Haider, you let Cornwallis go. Tipu, you would have made mincemeat of him, I know, but I vacillated. Haider, you're scared of him. Tipu, no, I'm not. If I was scared, I would have ordered a slaughter. But father, often, suddenly, I see myself in them. I see these white skins swarming all over the land, and I wonder what makes them so relentless, desperate. Most of them are no older than Fath Haider. What drives these young lads to such distant lands through fever, dysentery, alcohol, so often to death, wave after wave? They don't give up, nor would I. Sometimes I feel more confident of them than my own people. What makes them so unsparing towards themselves? Is it only money? Heather, you're beginning to think like a trader. Tipu angrily, no, if it was only for money, they would betray each other. But there's never any treachery against their own kind. No backstabbing. They believe in the destiny of the race. Why can't we? When our fort was besieged by Cornwallis, I knew several of my officers had already started secret negotiations with him. I even knew who they were my trusted officers, yet I couldn't expose them without bringing the whole edifice down. I had to keep saying they were the true pillars of my kingdom, that I depended on their loyalty to me and my family, and hope for the best. Hope that when the moment came, they wouldn't stab me in the back. But the English fight for something called England. What is it? It's not a religion that sustains them, nor a land that feeds them. They wouldn't be here if they did. It's just a dream for which they're willing to kill and die children of England. They have conquered our land, plundered its riches, and now they've started taking away my children. So Tipu admires the British for their loyalty to their own country and towards each other. They never seem to backstab each other. They never betray each other like Tipu Sultan's own officers or like the other princely states uh, of India who are unable to actually unite with him uh, in their opposition against the British. Many of them are bought over and bribed by the British and their power and the riches and their hopes for jobs uh, and employment in the British Empire. So Tipu Sultan here admires, uh, emerges as a very principled man who uh, will not compromise uh, his, uh, his, uh, his rule uh, and, and his people. In his encounter with Haripant, uh, who is uh, in the Maratha camp, Again, we see the difference in the responses between Tipu Sultan, who was indignant and enraged by the British and uh, their threat, while Hari Pant uh, believes he's not, he doesn't seem to have Tipu Sultan's uh, uh, sense of indignation and courage, and that uh, he would rather support the British like the Nizam uh, than fight them because they don't have the supplies, the forces, or the, the courage to actually stand up to the British. In fact, uh, the, the Maratha Empire is only interested in uh, ensuring that they get their lost territories back from Tipu Sultan, and so, including uh, Kodagu, the province of Kodagu, and so they're not really interested in um, uniting with Tipu Sultan. 
and Tipu says, uh, so while Haripant believes that Lord Cornwallis has been honest in redistributing the territory which Hyder Ali had once captured from uh, the Marathas, Tipu says in response, uh, he laughs uh, and he says, you have what, Haripant? How can you say that without blushing? Because Haripant says that we have a third share of our joint conquest. And Tipu says that the share that you have been given is what my father had won from you, Marathas, 40 years ago. What you've got is only a restitution of your earlier possessions. And in return, you have given the English new territories, Salem, Nindigal, the Malabar coast with its coconuts and pepper and its magnificent ports. You are back where you were while the English now have the entire coastline of India. So he resents uh, Haripant for uh, giving up certain very important territories which are strategically located along the coast, giving the British access to the coast and to sea trade. And remember, they are a seafaring power. Mine is a landlocked kingdom, so I thirst for the sea. For today, the sea is the key to power, to prosperity. You have the whole of the western coast. And instead of keeping the English out, you have permitted the shark into your waters and are trying to swim along with it. So Tipu Sultan uh, realizes the importance of the sea, uh, and considering his own state is landlocked, but he needs access to the sea to actually get replenishments and forces from the French and also to carry out his several trade agreements. So he is absolutely contentious of uh, the Marathas' lack of courage and for uh, honoring the treaties of the British uh, instead of uh, fighting them. And of course, the second uh, Governor General, Richard Wellesley, who was the second Earl of Man Mornington, is a far more severe and uh, determined Governor General, General than Cornwallis. He and his brother and the Colonel William Kirkpatrick ensure that the Sultan is, is finally vanquished. So, the, uh, the Earl of Mornington, uh, Robert Wellesley, is determined to uh, defeat Tipu Sultan because he realizes that Tipu Sultan has grown stronger ever since Lord Cornwallis left uh, by building a trading empire uh, on a European model which becomes uh, an immense success. So considering the British have managed to keep the French and the Dutch out of India and they've also contained the Portuguese, that they cannot tolerate uh, the uh, native prince, you know, forming a, a rebellion, a revolt against them. So even though Tipu has had uh, peaceful relationships with the East India Company uh, for seven years, uh, Mornington uh, decides that now is the time to attack him, precisely when he's least prepared for an attack or a war on him. So ultimately they do find, uh, end up entering the fort with the help of some of Tipu Sultan's uh, officers who betray him and they do end up killing uh, Tipu Sultan towards the end and his uh, descendants uh, are uh, basically doled out on a pension and they're sent off to Calcutta where they're kept under the sur surveillance of the British. So while the other British, uh, uh, I mean princely states are given uh, a, a rich amount of money uh, from the British uh, um, uh, the colonial state uh, after independence, uh, the, uh, the, the British reinstate the warriors in Mysore and they uh, exile uh, Tipu's, Tipu's descendants to uh, Calcutta uh, where they are kept under surveillance. And so the entire play revolves around that one dream of uh, Tipu Sultan that he has or just before he, he uh, sets out for his last war which, is, uh, which seems to suggest that and he in fact consults the astrologer, one of the important astrologers of Chennapatna who uh, predicts that he will win the war which he ironically does not. So the, the play actually ends on a very ironic uh, note where uh, Tipu Sultan's dream of absolute power and glory uh, is not fulfilled and he ends up being killed and his descendants while the other royal princely states are royally uh, rewarded by the, the, the British uh, Indian state uh, after independence for their loyalty, uh, it's the descendants of Tipu Sultan who are left to uh, rot in poverty in the slums of Calcutta. So that's it. Thank you.